All right, let's go ahead and open up to John chapter one. Uh, we spent the last couple of weeks looking at doing a, an introduction to it. We uh, took some time to look at some words. We looked at the word cosmos, uh, the world, what our tr English translation has for world. Uh, we looked and saw that the cosmos generally uh, was a place uh, apart from the Lord. It's in darkness. Uh, it's someplace apart from the Lord. Uh, and we learned that the Lord isn't of this world, his disciples aren't of this world, and his kingdom isn't of this world. Uh, but he's come into the world now to shine a light. And that's what we're going to look at, uh, especially this evening. We also looked at love in the Gospel of John. Uh, and that is the love of God at, at the cross of Christ, whereby Christ died for his friends. Uh, and that's a great love. But of course, when we go to Paul, we learn that there's even a greater love than that. Christ died for his enemies. Uh, and what an amazing thing. We also looked at uh, several other words. Probably the most important takeaway, though, at this point, however, is this chart here. Uh, I, I tried to make the black round back, so hopefully there isn't bands of color going through here, but it didn't really work very well. So I'm going to keep this up. You've, if you've got the slides in the email I sent, uh, maybe that'd be easier to look at. I'm not sure how this looks on the screen. But this is a very important uh, chart on salvation for the nation of Israel. Uh, and you're going to see as we go through the book of John that that's, this is what he's going to be emphasizing all the way along here. Uh, the, all of the Israelites are going to want to focus on uh, the kingdom uh, and what they're going to get in the kingdom and how they're going to enjoy the kingdom and how the kingdom is rightfully there and how they're going to rule the world and that God is going to subdue their enemies and, and they're not going to be ruled by Gentiles anymore. And they're all focused on this end of the salvation. John, and that's actually what Matthew, our study of Matthew brought out. Matthew, Mark, and Luke emphasize that. They emphasize people who are already in that believing remnant, uh, beginning with them calling out to John the Baptist and Jesus with the gospel of the kingdom. And they are now looking forward to entering that kingdom. Matthew explains uh, through faithfulness how they enter the kingdom and participate in its full blessings and benefits. John now is going to say, uh, now he's, he's almost not going to let any Israelite talk about the kingdom. Uh, we took note last week that the, the word kingdom is only, it's used 56 times in Matthew, 46 times in Luke, and 21 times in Mark. And it's only used three times in the book of John. He goes back further. Uh, it's used twice in the story with Nicodemus, and uh, it's all, so it's really only one time. It's, the word is used twice, but it's that one passage, and Jesus immediately shuts down Nicodemus. He won't talk about that. He takes Nicodemus over to this, justification by grace through faith, by believing the gospel of the kingdom. Everybody's going to come along there. They think, uh, remember, that's the problem with the vain religious system in Israel. They think that they're going to automatically participate in the kingdom and all its benefits and blessings because they're the natural children of Abraham through Isaac. They think they're going to automatically have those things. They think they're born in the world through Abraham and Isaac uh, already in a right relationship with God. But what they're forgetting is they're not only the sons of Abraham through the line of uh, uh, Isaac, they're also the sons of Adam. And that's what uh, John is going to drive home. He's going to come, they're assuming they have all this, but John's going to drive home the point, no, uh, John the Baptist and Jesus are going to come along and say, no, uh, you don't have this automatically. First, you have to start where Abraham started. Abraham didn't start with all those other things. He started with faith righteousness. That's the starting block. God just comes and preaches to ungodly sinners on enemy status before him, and he uh, and when they believe it, he justifies them unto eternal life. That's what the vain religious system is missing. They think through natural birth, they automatically 
uh, are, will be rewarded with the kingdom and have a right relationship with God. Jesus, John the Baptist, and John, our, our writer of the gospel here, he's going to say, no, that's not the case. You're not automatically in a right relationship with God. You have to first believe God and his word. Then you're ju he justifies you, he uh, counts your faith for righteousness. Then you're placed in the believing remnant of Israel, the true Israel in God's sight. And then God can do something with you. Just like was true with Abraham. First, it makes sure in, the, in the passages you read in Abraham, it makes sure you realize before God does anything with Abraham, he first justifies him by faith. Abraham, as makes a point, Genesis 15, 6, uh, that Abraham believed God and God counted his faith for righteousness. Then Abraham was put in the believing, uh, believing remnant of Israel, put in God's people for that day. And now God could do something with him. And he immediately makes an unconditional covenant with him. And then a little later, he gives him the sign of circumcision. And then a little later, uh, he gives him the promised son of Isaac. Then a little bit after that, he says, hey, Abraham, how would you like an opportunity to put on display something? How would you like to be a type, a picture of what I'm going to do with my son? the Lord Jesus Christ, 2,000 years later on that cross uh, by sacrificing your son Isaac. He gives him an opportunity to be a picture of that. And it's only after Abraham was justified by faith. A justification by faith is the starting point in all plans, purposes, dispensations, programs, everything. God just comes to, un, uh, to ungodly sinners on enemy status before him, the way everyone's born in the world, preaches good news to them. They believe it. God counts their faith for righteousness. Now, when we get into the book of John, uh, the big problem is there, everybody in Israel wants to talk about this end of the salvation. How they have a, they're entering the kingdom. They want the things of the kingdom, enjoy the privileges of the kingdom. The kingdom is theirs. They're going to get rid of the Gentile world. They're going to on and on and on. And you know what John's going to do? It, well, John, our writer, it's the recorder of this, and then John the Baptist and Jesus, they're not going to let the Israelites talk about this for the most part anyway. They're not going to let them talk about this. They're going to say, don't worry about this stuff because you need to worry about this first. Don't talk about the kingdom stuff. You're not even qualified for the kingdom. As a matter of fact, in the way you're approaching it, you've been actively disqualified. It's like a race. If you enter the race any place, uh, except at the starting block, it doesn't matter how many people you pass by. It doesn't matter how fast you run. It doesn't matter if you're the first one to pass the finish line because you didn't start at the starting block. Nothing else matters. You were disqualified from the first step on the track. And that's what Israel needed to understand. They thought they were born uh, and natural birth. Uh, they were automatically uh, in the line of Abraham and Isaac. And through natural birth, they automatically were in the race. They automatically had a right relationship with God. They automatically uh, were deserved that kingdom. They automatically would rule in that kingdom and enjoy its privileges. John's going to come along and say no, and he's not even going to let him talk about this. He's going to say, because first you've got to deal with that. You've got to start at the starting block, faith, righteousness. And I'm driving this point home a little bit because, uh, well, I'll just talk about the first five chapters, but it's true beyond that too. Uh, and uh, everything is going to be set up this way. When you get to John, at the beginning here, you're going to talk to see John talking to his disciples, John the Baptist talking to his disciples. And you know what they're going to want to know? They want to know, they want to talk about the Messiah and the kingdom, entering the kingdom, participating in the kingdom. And you know what he's going to say? Forget all that. You need to go and believe Christ. You need, and he points them to Christ and, and points them to faith. Even uh, when they get going and uh, in, at the, when the first uh, sign miracle, uh, at the t changing of the water to the wine, Mary, she comes along, his mother Mary comes along, and she says, let's bring in some of the joy of the kingdom. And he says, my hour hasn't yet come. And she goes out, 
Uh, and she wants to talk about the kingdom. And he says, no, we got to talk about something else first. Faith in me. And then she points the servants. She points them to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you get to Nicodemus. He comes in. He wants to talk about the things of the kingdom. You get the idea there. And I, I will see this when we go. He's kind of doing a job interview. Hey, I want to be, uh, maybe G Jesus can help him uh, get an advanced, be an advanced ruler in that kingdom. And Jesus uh, reads his heart and he says a couple things about the kingdom. Then he shuts it down and the rest of the whole of chapter three, he says, but first you have to believe in me. First, he takes them back to the starting block. Don't worry about this, Nicodemus. You're not even qualified. Contrary to what you think, you're not even qualified. You have to go to the starting block of faith righteousness. Then you're going to go out to the Samaritan woman. And what is she going to want to quibble over? She wants to quibble over re religious items that have to do with the kingdom and the future and all that. And he says, no, don't worry about all that. You got to go back to faith. And you, if you knew who there was, uh, he could give you living water. And he points him, her back to him. Got to believe in him and his word. And it just goes on and on like that. You got the nobleman's son. Uh, he's going to he, uh, he's going to be in, uh, involved in that. And if you think about the feeding of the five thousand, uh, what at the end of that account, Jesus is a little irritated because uh, they all come and all they're worried about is eating the food of the kingdom. They want to get break him king, and get a free lunch every day, a free physical lunch. And what does he say? He says, don't worry about the physical food that you're going to get in the kingdom. Don't worry about that. Worry about me, believing on me, the spiritual food. That's the bread you should be worried about. Every single one of these accounts, he's going to steer them away from this. You're jumping the gun, Israel. You're getting ahead of yourself. You're not even qualified for this because you haven't started at the starting block. And that's uh, one of the most, you're going to see this slide over and over again, because almost every encounter is set up following this pattern. They're going to want to talk about this. He's not going to let them. And he's someone, either himself or someone else, is going to point them to him and say, you have to believe in him. You have to believe on him. And so that's probably uh, for just the general thrust of the book. Uh, I think this is one, the most important slide. So we'll, you'll be seeing that uh, in the future. All right, let's just go ahead and jump now. We're going to develop the text here, uh, hopefully get down through at least verse 14. Uh, we've covered the first five verses pretty carefully so far, so we'll just read through these. In the beginning was the word... Uh, so there you have, in the beginning, uh, the word already was. The, all, the word was already existent. He's eternally preexistent. Uh, and, uh, and what else is true of him here? The, verse 1, and the word was with God. So now you know there's uh, a tri that we know it's a triune Godhead, and the Word was a member of the triune Godhead. He's a with God. He's in uh, eternal fellowship with God. Now the question comes to this that, you should, that anyone reading this text should think. How could someone that's been eternally preexistent and is in eternal fellowship with God, how can that person do that? Well, there's only one way you can be eternally preexistent and in eternal fellowship with God, and that's the end of verse 1, and the Word was God. Only God can be eternally preexistent only and, and be eternally in eternally constant fellowship with God, as if he is God. The Lord, Je the Lord Jesus Christ, as we find out who this Word is going to be, uh, and uh, he's eternal God, absolute deity. He's the word. Uh, and so the word, the outer expression of God's inner thoughts, the word is that's the Greek word logos. It's he's, the word is going to take the things that God, the triune Godhead is thinking, uh, their inner motives, their inner desires, their inner thoughts, and he's going to proclaim them. He's going to make them known. The word, just like what we do with words. What do we do? We think something up in the, in the inside, 
And then when we want to share them, we speak them. We come, we, we find words, and we speak them. Uh, and we see that's exactly what Jesus Christ is going to do here. The same, verse uh, 2, the same was in the beginning with God. So he's absolute, he's eternally preexistent, he's eternally in fellowship with God, and the only way he could do this is if he is God and was God, uh, and he is God. Uh, and now he's going to do some things. As God, he's going to do something. Verse 3, as God, he's going to, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So now you have the preexistent, eternal one, in eternal fellowship with, with God, uh, because he is God. As God, he proclaims, he speaks creation into existence. Remember the creation story back in Genesis 1? And God said, let there be light, let there be this, let there be that. Uh, and that's what he does. He speaks the word, speaks the universe, speaks creation uh, in, into, cre into existence. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He made everything. He's the creator God. He's not a part of creation. He's uh, distinct and separate. He's the creator of creation. And uh, that's what he does as God. It's another sign of deity. Only uh, a God could be create all things. Now we're going to get another facet of his deity. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. So now just if you, I kind of kind of just run through this each time so you can see the flow. Remember I, I mentioned John uh, is, I think, one of the, another important thing to keep in mind. There's always flow. The, the, the movement never stops. Uh, you can't sit down with a, with a bag of popcorn. Uh, you got to keep moving to keep up with the program. And here you have the eternally preexistent one, the Word, who's in eternal fellowship with God because he's absolute God. He speaks, the, speaks creation into existence. And then uh, because he's God and has life within himself, uh, see, that's a, a sign of deity, having life within himself. None, no one in the creation, nothing and no one in creation has life within themselves. Uh, life in the creation comes from the outside. Someone has to give it to us, whether you're talking about physical life, soulish life, or you're talking about spiritual life, a relationship with God. Uh, you, it has to be given. So this word, who's absolute God, as God spoke the creation into existence, and then he focuses down especially, he gives life to all animate creatures, but then he's going to, John focuses even narrower to specifically humans, humanity, and he says at the end of verse 4, and the life was the light of men. And so this life is the light of men. So he's talking more than just uh, physical life here. Certainly he breathed soulish life into all, into the animals and into his human creation. But then in his human creation, he imparted his own life, his spiritual life. And that's, remember what we read in John, what's uh, eternal life is a relationship with God. So he makes, he speaks the creation into existence. Then as God, he gives it life, soulish, physical life. But then beyond that, he gives us human creation, spiritual life, a relationship with God. And that enlightens them and that uh, energizes them. And, th and then what does, G what does uh, the creator say at that point? We looked at it last week, so we won't turn there again this week. Last few verses of Genesis 1. And it was very good. But now something happens in verse 5. And the light shineth, uh-oh, shineth in darkness. Notice, uh, you have to notice this in these verses, the first four verses, it's referring to a past event. Look in verse 1, in the beginning was, and then after that the word was, uh, and then after that verse 3, all things were made, past tense, by him, and without him was nothing made, in him was life. Everything's past, it's in the going back into history, back in the past. 
and the life was, past tense, the light of men. So there was a time when humanity was enlightened by the life of God. But now, verse 5, now he changes tenses. Our apostle John changes tenses and he says, and the light shines. And that's a continuous present. Now in the present, he's shining light. And the light he's shining out now is going into darkness, penetrating into the darkness. Something happened, uh, especially we looked at the word cosmos, the human creation. That's mostly, not in every single instance, but mostly what John's going to be referring to. That human creation went into darkness. The spiritual life they had in a relationship with God uh, was uh, ceased. Uh, we know the human creation went their own way, rebelled against God, uh, and rejected and rejected his word. Uh, and so they went their own way. We see that. Go over to John, or excuse me, Romans 1.18. Uh, and just refresh our memory with this. Paul kind of gives an overview of this. Humanity at one point uh, was in a right relationship with God, was enlightened by the life of God. Uh, but then look what happened. Look at Romans uh, 1.18. We'll just read a couple of these verses. Paul kind of illuminates the whole thing here. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Notice it says they hold the truth. They have the truth, but they're holding it. Uh, in unrighteousness. They're uh, burying it away. They're not using it rightly. They're using it wrongly. They're throwing it away. They're holding it down. Uh, they're refusing to believe it. They have it. God made it known to them. And we're going to read that in the next verses here. Look at verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. God made this known to them. He gave them this information. He revealed himself to them. For God has showed it to him. Verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and, and, and Godhead, deity, so that they are without excuse. The good creation, the very good creation that was enlightened with the life of God in a relationship with God, uh, had taken that truth, taken what God revealed of himself, uh, and subverted it, uh, held it down, repressed it, and they repressed it so long that they forgot about it, rebelled against God, rejected his truth, and they went off in the darkness. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, see, they knew him they, earlier as they held the truth. After that, he said, God revealed himself to them. God worked with them. God made himself known. Now he says, because that when they knew him, uh, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Their thoughts became empty uh, of all content uh, uh, and their foolish heart was darkened. And notice heart there's in the singular. It's referring to humanity as a whole. Fell into uh, sin and death uh, re in their rebellion against God, rejection of his word. And even though God kept, as it says in John here, shining the light to them, they kept rejecting it. He made himself known to them. Uh, in the days of Noah, it says, his spirit strove with them. How long will my spirit strive with them? God kept shining the light in the darkness, shining the light in the darkness. Uh, that he shined the light in dispersing the nations. He shined the light when he created his own nation from Abraham. He shined the light in that nation, and even that nation rejected him. And now when we get into the beginning of John, God's not going to give up on shining the light. He's going to find a way to shine the light uh, that's completely uh, something he's never done before, something unique. And we're going to read that as we go through here. So when you see in verse 5, we're back to John 1 now. And the light shineth in darkness, and darkness comprehended it tonight. The good it, it not. 
the good creation fell into darkness because they rebelled against God, rejected his word, but God is going to persist and shining that light. It's going to be a continuous presence. That at one point, uh, it was a very good, enlightened creation in a relationship with God. And another moment through the fall, uh, it became a darkened creation. And he shined the light. And of course, one of the key aspects of that shining light is uh, he goes down and he preaches good news uh, to ungodly sinners on enemy status before him. He preached good news to Adam. He preached good news to Noah. He preached good news to Abraham. And when they believed it, God counted their faith for righteousness, uh, justified them unto eternal life. And what does it say in our verse here? And that life was the light of men, enlightening them and energizing them. Uh, and so he's going to persist in shining the light. And, and so now you get you read this in John and go, okay, uh, how is he going to shine the light in John? Is he going to send another prophet like he did in the Old Testament? Uh, is he going to give him some more revelation like he did in the Old Testament? Uh, is he going to do something else? How is he going to shine this light? That's kind of the suspense of this whole prologue as you go through these 14 to 18 verses here. Uh, and uh, so now we're going to get another aspect of this. So he's going to keep shining the light in there. A couple other points, interesting points I just want to bring out in those first five verses, and then we'll go on. Uh, notice the, the, in the, how it all starts in the beginning. Uh, and I think it's kind of, well, we want to compare it to the other Gospels. It's kind of interesting to see that Mark goes, starts his Gospel at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. John goes further back than that. Uh, Matthew uh, it starts his gospel, I guess you could say kind of focused on the birth of Christ, uh, and goes back in the genealogy to David and even Abraham. John goes back further than all that, goes back further than his earthly ministry, further than his birth, further than David, further than Abraham. Then you go to Luke. Luke uh, kind of starts at the conception of Jesus, and his genealogy goes back to Adam. John goes back further than that. He's before the beginning of his earthly ministry, goes back before the birth, before the conception of Jesus, before David, before Abraham, before Adam, before all of creation, the word already was. Pre-existent, eternally pre-existent word of God. He was already there. He's before all that. He was there in eternity past. He's the creator God of all things uh, and the giver of life and light to humanity. Uh, and so the word in relation to God is an eternity past. And he's a distinct person within that Godhead. Uh, we won't turn to it now, but, uh, well, yeah, let's turn to Zechariah. I think it's just, uh, just before Malachi, isn't it? which is the last book of the Old Testament, what's typically called the Old Testament. Zechariah 13, 7. And he's talking, 13, 7 here. Uh, he's talking, this is the return of the Lord. And we're not going to go into all the details of what Zechariah is doing here, but I just want to kind of point this out. When he talks about who Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ is, uh, this is what he says to him. I guess we'll have to bring again in verse 6, and it'll be obvious who he's talking about. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? So we know he's talking about the Lord, Je the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Then he shall answer, Those that which, uh, which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Remember, Christ died for his friends. Verse 7, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. The shepherd is the Lord Jesus Christ. And against, uh, against the man that is my fellow. So here you have a unique situation. You have the shepherd who's absolute God, Jehovah God. I am the shep, the good shepherd. Uh, and he is also the man. And that God man is also God's fellow. That's just another way of saying what John said. Uh, the word was with God. Uh, he was in fellowship with God, fellowship with God. He was his fellow. How can you be a fellow, uh, a co-person with God? Well, you have to be God. 
you have to be God. Uh, and so he's driving home that point. Uh, it's absolute God, the word. Uh, and he, of course, we know we've read the, the book of John and we've been taught on it. We know that's going to be the Lord Jesus Christ as we go f a little bit further on these verses. All right. So he's we also learned that he's the creator God. We learned that in verses through in verse three. And we learn that having life within himself, he is the light of humanity. Uh, but now humanity's in darkness. The cosmos, the human uh, realm of existence is in darkness. Uh, and so God's going to send the light again. But they're in darkness. Uh, and so he's going to uh, send some pointers with him. And one pointer in specific. So at that point, let's pick it up at verse 6. Back to John 1. Verse 6, there was a man sent from God. Now we're in time. Now we're on, on planet Earth. We've left the eternal realm and we're on the uh, worldly realm at this point. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. So now this, is in, this opens up an interesting thing uh, because uh, he, John has been sent to do something. And what is it John's been sent to do? Verse 7, the same John came for a witness. God sent him to be a witness, to bear witness to the light that all men through him might believe. Uh, and so we're back at our diagram, that important diagram at the beginning. Uh, he's going to point them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they believe on him, they receive eternal life. And John's come to point out the light. Now, the question is, if the light comes in the world, why does it need a pointer? Why does someone need to point it out? As a matter of fact, read the next verse, verse 8. Uh, he has to make sure everyone understands. And he says this in different ways, not always in the light, dark, uh, the light concept, uh, but uh, in other ways as well. He says he was not that light. John, is, John the Baptist isn't the light but was sent to bear witness of the light. So that brings up a couple very important questions in my mind anyway. The first of all is why did the light need to be pointed out? And the second question is why would, it, would people confuse John for the light, the light of God? Why would they confuse that? And it all goes back to verse uh, 5. It's because they're in darkness. It's that whole darkness concept. Uh, and it's important to understand that a uh, lot of people are going to be pointing. As a matter of fact, I think in last week or the week before, I, actually, I think at the end of last week, we went through the, basically the first five chapters of John and saw everybody's acting as a pointer, pointing to the light, pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. John's going to point to Christ. He's going to point the Jews to Christ. He's going to point his disciples to Christ. He's going to point the crowds to Christ. Uh, Jesus is going to point other people to himself. He points the, the um, Samaritan woman to himself. He points, himself to, points to himself for Nicodemus. Uh, Mary points the servants to Christ when, he, when Jesus changes the, water, the wine. Uh, everyone's going to change. Even the, the nobleman, when you get out, uh, the Samaritan woman, let's not forget her. Uh, he points to himself with the Samaritan woman. What does she do? She goes and points the men in the city, the people of the city, to Jesus. And then those Samaritans point other Samaritans to Jesus. And then the next account is this, uh, the healing of the nobleman's son. Uh, and what is, happens at the end of that account? Uh, the nobleman believes, Jesus points to himself, the nobleman believes in Jesus, and he goes to his household, and they believe. He points them to Jesus. you got all these people pointing to the light, pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the, the question is, why would he need to be pointed at? Well, it's because the people are in darkness. The world, the cosmos, the world is in darkness. It can't see. Uh, and uh, they need to, uh, to uh, be pointed out. It, it's like there's, a, imagine, uh, maybe we should talk about this darkness a little more uh, because the darkness is a willful darkness. 
It's like uh, the whole of Israel are blind people. Imagine a bunch of blind people at a, at a street crossing and uh, they're trying to figure out when the light changes color. Well, they can't, right? You need to have someone come along, take them by the arm and point them the way when the lights changed. They had to point them to the light. Well, that's kind of what the nation of Israel was like, uh, and we'll look at, at that as well. It's a willful blindness that they've entered into, and uh, they've fallen into the trap of all of fallen humanity. So the word as light in relation to the world of humanity, be, and it's going to begin with his own people. So let's go down to verse 9, and we'll pick up on this as we go through here. Verse 9 to 13, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So here we have a great principle. Uh, this is what, what I'm saying when we come to this chart here, this important chart. Every single person is born into the world dead in the quicksand of sin and death. Everybody, the Israelites fell in the trap of thinking that was just true of the Gentiles, but they are a special people. They are, they are born uh, through the line of Adam or Abraham, and therefore I have a special relationship to God. And that's what they don't. It says here in verse 9, every man needs the, to be enlightened by this light, by the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, by faith in him, faith in him and his word. Every single person, verse 9, verse 9, he says, that was the true light which lights everyone that comes into the world. Everyone is born in the world in the quicksand of sin and death, held down by the forces of evil. They can't do anything. They live in darkness. They can't do anything. Someone needs to come to them, preach good news. They believe it, and God counts their faith for righteousness, uh, and they're justified unto eternal life. That's what everyone needs to be enlightened. Then God can do something with them. Then God can work with them. Verse 10, so he's come in the world and he's going to give something that everyone needs. And he came, was in the world, verse 10, and the world was made by him and the world didn't know him. Uh, so now you have the whole world. He's been shining the light in the world since the fall of Adam. He's been shining and the whole world rejected him. The whole world rejected him. Now verse 11, and he came to his own then. So he, the, all the nations of the world rejected him. He created his own nation uh, and went to it. And they didn't, they didn't receive him either. They rejected him. And, uh, but to those that received him, verse 12, to them gave he power to become the sons or children of God. We'll talk about that phrase probably next week. Even to them that believe in his name. We're back to believe again. We're back to that believing. That's the starting point. That's the beginning of everything. They don't need to worry about anything else. That's every person's plight when they're born in this world. Uh, they need to be saved uh, by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, justified before God by faith and enter into a right relationship with him. Then verse 13, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. And, but they needed to be born of God. A spiritual rebirth. Natural birth, his point is that the Israelites were wrong. It wasn't enough just to be a natural born child or son of Abraham, child of Abraham through the line of Isaac, you had to also and first be a, a child of God. You had to be born of God. And that's what he's come to do. That's what John, everybody's going to be pointing to Jesus because he's the one that you need to believe in. He's the one whose word you need to believe. All people need, born into the world need the light of God's life, including the Israelite. They're not, not a special case. Uh, their lineage goes all the way back to Adam as well. And that is what gives them, makes them participants in faith righteousness. Uh, then he was in the world, the world he created, but it rejected him. We just read about that in Romans 1, 18 to 32. And now they're not in a living relationship with him. And if they're not uh, in, ha if they don't have his life, what do they also don't have? They don't have his light. 
they're living in darkness. Because remember, verse five, his, uh, verse four, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. So they live in darkness. Then he came to his own nation, and they rejected him in unbelief. And that's really where we pick up in John. He's come to his own nation now. And they prove to be in darkness as well. And they reject him. But some did receive him by faith. And to those, he gave the authority or the power uh, to become the children of God by giving them eternal life through a spiritual rebirth. Uh, that new creation uh, and that children aspect. Go over, to go back to, uh, keep your finger in John, but go back to Matthew 16. Look how Matthew puts that children uh, being born of God kind of concept. He doesn't put it in those words, but go back to Matthew 16, or excuse me, Matthew 18, Matthew 18, uh, verse 1. It's the sermon of the child, uh, verse 1. At, that, at the same time came the disciples unto, unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? Uh, and what does he steer them to? How does he explain that question? Verse 2. And Jesus called a little child unto him and said unto, set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted. We're back to faith righteousness. He takes them back. Even in Matthew, he takes them back. It has to be faith righteousness. You have to be born again and converted and become as little children ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever, therefore, shall humble himself as this little child, uh, the same is greater in the kingdom of heaven. Brings out this child, uh, child uh, concept, to be a child of God by faith. The first step is faith righteousness. Then you're placed in the, the God places you in the believing remnant. Then he can do something with you. Then he can ask you to do things. Then he can give you opportunities to do things. And he can work in and through you. And that's what they're going to be doing through that tribulation period. Uh, and that's the first step. Uh, that's always the first step in every program. So to reveal this life and light most effectively, the word actually uh, became human. So, and you could just see the buildup going here. I tried to introduce it a little earlier. Here you have the light continues to shine in the darkness. But wait a minute. God says he has to, in order, he's going to keep on doing that, but uh, he, do, he has to send a pointer. He has to send John to point out the light. And there's even a chance the people who are so blinded, they may even think John is the light instead of Jesus. That's like uh, saying, now Jesus is going to say John, John was a bright and shining light, but you see, John was a lamp. <laughs> he was a reflected light. Uh, he was a little light. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be uh, the, like the light of the sun. He's going to be a great light. And they were so blinded that they didn't even know that they, someone had to tell them which was the true light. John says, it's not me, it's him, it's Jesus. And he's, so the question is, why, does this, why is God doing something now that's going to require a pointer? How is he going to shine the light and someone needs to point out the light? How is he going to do this? How is he going to come in to his people? How is he going to uh, call out people that will receive him? How is he going to do all this? Is he going to send a prophet like he did in the Old Testament? Is he going to send another book of the Bible? Is he going to send another more revelation? Is he going to give us a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ like when he did the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament? Is it going to be something like that? And now John is going to explain, no, it's something infinitely greater than any way God has ever revealed himself before. Not like any of those other ways. Verse 14, and the word was made flesh. Whoa, that's how he's going to do it. The word who has life within himself, that's the light of men. He's going to now enflesh himself. That's what incarnate means. Uh, to take on the, the incarnation, incarnate Latin, carne is meat or flesh. He's going to enflesh himself, incarnate himself into humanity. 
He's going to do something he never did before. This is different. He's not just sending another prophet. He's not sending a king in the name of the Lord. He's not just sending, uh, a pre, it's not a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ even as the angel of the Lord or anything like that. God is now through the word, uh, and which is the light of men, is going to enflesh himself into, the, into humanity and specifically into the humanity of David to become an Israelite so that who could do the one thing no other Israelite could do, and that is to save the nation of Israel. Redeem her, the five mandates of that Davidic covenant, redeem her, deliver and avenge her uh, through that tribulation, uh, and just deliver his friends, destroy his enemies, usher them into the kingdom then, where he'll be their king and bless her. And then make her the greatest of, of nations and light her up and be the light uh, to the whole world. And all the nations will come, will see what God did with Israel and will come and say, do that with us. And all the nations will come into Israel and worship to God together with Israel and through her rise. That's the prophetic program. That's the basic prophetic program. And to re so to reveal this life, he's not doing it uh, in one of those other ways that he's done in the past. To reveal this life and light most effectively, the word actually became a human, revealing the Father to fellow humans by the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he comes as a man so that he could reveal the Father man to man, human to human, uh, to, in the midst of darkness, and he's going to shine the light that way, and he's going to make it known. Now look what it says here. It says, he was made flesh and he dwelt among us. That's that tabernacle concept. He's going he's to cover himself with the skins of humanity, and he's going to walk among them. And through his word and his works, he's going to reveal the glory of the Father, uh, and of the, the glory is going to reach its pinnacle at the death and resurrection and exaltation of the Son in obedience to the Father. And it says here, and we look at John uh, just going on and on uh, in just awesome wonder, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. All right, so he's going to tabernacle among them, he came like the tabernacle of old, only in a very different way. He's not, he's not covered with animal skins, and he's not a cloud hovering over or in the tabernacle. Uh, he's now enfleshed himself in the line of humanity, taken on hum, uh, human, for human, humanity, uh, and, and f human flesh, and he is going to share God's glory now human to human and reveal the Father through the Son. And all who believe will see it. Uh, it's going to be a glory that can only be seen with the eyes of faith. You have to believe and then you see it. Uh, to others, to the unbelievers, it looks like foolishness. Uh, to the saved, to the believers, those who believe, those who are born again of God. They respond like John here in verse 14, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the, of the Father, full of grace and truth. I think it's a good idea now, maybe we'll just uh, take a look at this word, only begotten son. And just kind of think for a minute about some of the things this means. Uh, only begotten has a couple of meanings. One is that it's one of a kind in a specific relationship. Uh, and that's kind of confusing, but it, we, there's a perfect example of this in the Bible, and that's the relationship of Abraham, Isaac, uh, and Abraham's other sons. Uh, in that relationship, Abraham called him a, Isaac his only son. When, but in fact, he had many other sons. So it can't mean he was the only one in number. Uh, it had to mean something else. And that was he's the only one, the only one who was the promised child. He was one among many. He was unique in a certain way. He was the child of promise. 
He was the one and only son of promise. Uh, so he was unique among other sons. Abraham had many other sons, uh, but Isaac was, was one of a kind because he, one of many, because he was the promised son. But that's not what it means when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it has another meaning, and that is being the only one of its kind. In other words, there's no, uh, Isaac was one of many sons, one of, a unique one among many. Jesus is a unique one, uh, one of a kind, and he doesn't have anyone else in his group. There's no one else in his group. Uh, he's completely unique and is used, uh, is, is the work terminology used of Christ. Look at verse 18. We'll add this here since that kind of is in the same general area verse 18 no man hath seen god at any time only the only begotten son which is in the bosom of the father he hath declared him there you have that only earlier it was only begotten now of the father now you have the only begotten son of the father uh, and there's a son because they share the divine nature He's a son. He's not one of many sons. He's the one and only son uh, who can reveal the Father because he uh, participates in the actual divine deity nature of the Father. He shares in the divine nature of God. He's the eternal word. That's why he, John drove that point home before you get to verse 14 and 18, uh, that the word who enfleshed, there was the light of men who enfleshed himself into humanity uh, and is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he made sure you understood that first. And now he can do what he does. He can reveal because he's the word. He's the fellow of God. He's actually, the, he has the nature of God. He's, de he's deity himself. He's God himself. He shares that nature with the Father. The eternal word, divine nature, uh, Christ's eternal uh, divine nature, as the word was joined to human nature, whereby the Father gave, him, gave to his unique and one-of-a-kind Son all the things of his glory. Just flip over to chapter 3, verse 35. Chapter 3, verse 35. Notice what it says here, verse 35, The Father loveth the Son, and hath given him all things into his hand. Uh, that's another sign of deity, right? How could God the Father give everything to the Son, and him be able to hold it and, and make use of it, uh, unless he was God? God gave his infinite things to the Son, so the only way the Son could receive them is if he was infinite. He's absolute God. He has the nature of God. He's the son in that sense. Uh, maybe it'd be a good idea to look at another example of this. Uh, he's the only one qualified to do this because he is the father's divine nature. Uh, but maybe let's go ahead uh, and look at point four here first, actually. You can kind of think of this if this gets a little bit confusing with the idea of Jesus is the only son without any peers because he has the Father's divine nature. And go over to Mark. Go over to Mark. Go over to Mark chapter 3, verse 17. And you'll see a way in which this is used that's, a, that's uh, different than what we've been talking about here and is the way that it's used of Christ. Uh, look at Mark 3:17. And he says here, uh, 3.17 isn't the right verse. Let's, oh, I'm in Luke. That's why it doesn't work. Luke. Ma Mark 3.17. Mark 3.17. And James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James. So you have John and James here, the disciples. And he surnamed them Bonerges, which is the sons of thunder. Here you have uh, sons who are named by thunder. Now, what does that mean? That means that those sons of thunder 
uh, James and Jens are the sons of thunder, meaning that they have the same aggressive nature of their father. So whoever their father was, he must have been known as having a pretty aggressive nature. And the, their, their natures was the same as that, so they're called the sons of thunder. They have the nature of their father, uh, that aggressive nature of the father. Well, something similar that, like that with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the son of God because he has the nature of God. He's absolute God. He's the deity of God. He has the nature of God, uh, his father, uh, and he has that nature. So he's the son of God. And as the son of God, he's the only one uh, that can do this. Uh, he's in John 14, 9, it says that he that has seen Jesus has seen the father. And because Jesus has the very nature of the Father. It's like the sons of thunder. They have the very nature of their Father, his aggressive uh, personality or whatever it is, his aggressive nature. Uh, Jesus has the very nature of God himself and therefore can be the revealer, the perfect and complete revealer of God the Father because he has the same, he's of the same nature and he can perfectly reveal him. Uh, and make him known to the point where he could tell the disciples that uh, if you've seen me, Jesus, you've seen the Father. Uh, and so maybe that makes it a little bit easier, but that's why he, what he's going to do now. Go back to John 1, John 1, and we'll start wrapping it up here. Uh, but the word... Uh, the Word who is absolute God, he had the nature of God, uh, and he was in fellowship with God, uh, and he who is the light of men and fleshed himself into the line of humanity, became a man, took on human flesh, and became the perfect revealer of God his Father because he participates in the same nature as a Father. He, he participates in the nature of deity. He's absolute God. God has given him everything. He's revealed to him everything. He's made known to him everything. He's given him everything. And now he's going to take those things and reveal them to humanity. And he can do it perfectly because he is God. He has the nature of God. Uh, and, and now it's been joined to the nature of humanity. And together he's going to go and be the perfect revealer of God to humanity. The God the Father to humanity, to give them that light, to bring them in a right relationship with God, to bring them into their own relationship, we're going to learn in John uh, 17. Uh, now we'll go back to point three. All other sons in the Bible are, are sons in, different, in other ways. Uh, some are sons in the Bible, uh, such as the angels. Uh, we won't turn to all these passages, but in, the angels are referred to uh, as sons of God by creation. They were uh, created directly by God. Adam in Luke, uh, I think it's Luke uh, 1, 6, or Luke um, 3, 38, uh, Adam is going to be referred to uh, as a son of God because he was directly created by God. Uh, so be a son of God in that sense. So sons of God by creation. Uh, the other times the Bible uses the word sons as sons by adoption. Uh, by son placing, being brought into the family of God by adoption kind of concept. Uh, and that refers to the nation of Israel. Remember when they came out of Egypt? Uh, what did he tell Pharaoh? He says, uh, Israel is my son. Let my son go. That's what he intended them to be. That's what he intended them to be uh, until they went under that covenant, that law covenant of Sinai. He intended to instruct them as his adult sons. Israel would be in adult sonship position. They entered that law and they, they uh, gave that away. They threw that away. Uh, so too, if we go to Romans 8, uh, 14 and 15, we remember from our Roman study uh, that today members of the body of Christ are son placed, are adopted into the fam through adoption uh, into the family of God, play son placed as adult sons and daughters in the family of God. But you see, that's, that's different than Jesus being the son of God. Uh, he's not a son of God by creation. He's not a son of God by adoption. He's son of God because he has the very nature of God. 
He is God. And that's uh, where the, the sonship comes in. And that's what will lead us next time into maybe looking some things about uh, in verse 11, uh, verse 12 here, where it talks about be having the power to become the sons uh, or the children of God. And we'll take a look at that next time. Uh, so as we go ahead with that in mind, this darkness is willful spiritual blindness uh, just as when natural light dispels darkness, it is of no avail to those who willfully close their eyes. So too, the presence of the spiritual life of God that dispels spiritual darkness is of no avail to those who willfully keep their spiritual eyes closed uh, in unbelief. It must be received by faith. And uh, we'll close with this also and pick it up next time, just kind of a tip off to next time. Uh, this darkness concept, see the issue isn't here, they're in darkness uh, and they can't see. There's, a, we just said, some are able to see, some receive them, some believe, and they're uh, given the authority to be the children and sons of God. Some do receive. So it's not that they can't, not that it's impossible for them to see, they're unable to see. The problem with the darkness here is it's willful darkness. They refuse to open their eyes. They hold their eyes closed. God makes himself known and they tune him out. They throw him away. They close their eyes to the light. Uh, and just like sometimes it's talked about uh, darkness is just is nothing and, and light dispels the darkness. Uh, that's not that's not exactly what it's talking about here. If you put someone who's clenching their eyes shut and in, a, in a dark room and they clench their eyes shut and you turn the light on, does it change anything? No, they're still in darkness. That's what is going on here in the book of John. He, Jesus comes shining the light and they're still they're refusing to open their eyes. They're clenching their eyes shut and refusing to come out. You know, there's uh, a movie called Lord of the Rings. I don't know if anyone saw it, but there is a character in there called Gollum. Uh, and he was a perfectly normal <laughs> hobbit. Uh, and then he, he did some, th uh, he murdered someone and some other things without getting into all that. But he ended up going and fleeing and decided he wanted to live in a cave. And he lived in the darkness of the cave so long uh, when he got, every now and then he'd get chased out by something and he'd go out in the light and he'd sit there and keep his eyes shut and cover his eyes and he wouldn't want it, he didn't want, hated the sunshine and he just, and he, wanted, he ran back in the cave of darkness. He can't even see. He refused to open his eyes, he refused to come out of the darkness. He came out of the darkness and ran back in. That's the darkness. The darkness isn't that it's impossible, they, they're uh, impossible for them to believe or see. Uh, the, the problem uh, is that they're willfully clenching their eyes shut. And that's what we'll take a look at. We'll look at some things in Isaiah next time. They're willfully rejecting the light by keeping their eyes closed in unbelief. Uh, it's not the absence of light. Uh, it's the positive presence in the world system of evil uh, and the rejection of light. And we'll close on that. <laughs> we'll close with a word of prayer.